Now let's talk about lube oil selection for rolling element bearings. Like we talked about, the difference between a plain bearing and a rolling element bearing is the type of lubrication regime that they're in. So plain bearings experience what we call hydrodynamic lubrication, and that's when what we have two what we call conforming surfaces. So effectively, the radius of the inner diameter and the outer diameter is so similar that if you look at them under a microscope, the, the surfaces look like they're parallel to each other. And so what we have is effectively a sliding motion. Now, elastohydrodynamic lubrication happens when we have two surfaces that are not conforming. So basically, the radius of one is significantly different from the other. And so instead of having a sliding motion, we have what we call a rolling motion between the two. Now, you can think of a couple of different instances where we see this. So rolling element bearings are the obvious one, but we also have cams as well as gears. So these are instances where we have non-conforming contacts, and therefore we have elastohydrodynamic lubrication. And that's the main thing that makes uh, lubrication of rolling element bearings different from plane bearings. So now that we've established that we have elastohydrodynamic lubrication, it's also important to remember that we have a substantially thinner lubricant film. So rather than being on that sort of two, you know, maybe 50 to 100 to up to 200 micron range, now we're talking single digit microns. And to give you an idea of how big that is, once again, a blood cell, a white blood cell, is just 25 microns. They're obviously invisible to the naked eye. And the ICP detection limit, that is to say, um, when you get your used oil analysis results, they go to about 8 micron. Okay. Now, uh, the, the fluid is going to be forced through this extremely narrow gap where it compresses, right? Some of it is going to be pushed back out, and that results in a little bit of back pressure. And what you get is a rapid, rapid increase in pressure. So we know that viscosity increases with pressure, but you know across this gap, what's going to happen is that we have a, a massive increase in pressure. And most of the time, uh, EHL theory tells us that it goes through kind of what we call a glass transition. So the viscosity is so high that uh, effectively, the lubricant kind of becomes like a glass-like material, and that's why it's able to support so much load. So the pressures that we're talking about now are so high that they actually elastically deform the surface. So if you were to look at, at it under a microscope and you were able to pause it, what you'd see is that the rolling elements actually deform when they go through the load zone, and then um, it's kind of like a basketball, right, would deform when it bounces, and then obviously uh, it, it is restored on the other side. Now, one thing that's really important um, with rolling element bearings is the development of uh, fatigue wear. So because they go through so many cycles and, and cyclic loading is a, a key component of fatigue wear, often with rolling element bearings, what we're doing is we're selecting a lubricant viscosity that is going to put us over the fatigue limit. So fatigue wear happens when you have repeated cycling um, and eventually it leads to the development of micro cracks. These cracks then grow through a process called crack propagation and eventually you're going to have some of these cracks connect up with each other and you'll get the formation of a wear particle. Now this process over time eventually leads to the characteristic micro pitting that you often see in rolling element bearings. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid what's called the fatigue limit. So if we have cyclic stresses, now I get it, if you're doing vibration analysis it's Typically, the, the wave signature is much more complicated than this. And we're just boiling it down for the sake of simplicity. This is the kind of thing that you would see in a hydrostatic bearing, right? So um, we have one shaft rotating inside of another shaft. And so the stress over time is happening cyclically. When we go to a rolling element bearing, there's obviously a whole bunch of different rotating components. So you've got the cage, you've got the rolling elements, you have the inner diameter, you have the outer diameter, then you might have a whole host of other vibrations. And so you're getting a much more complicated waveform. But ultimately what we're trying to do is we are trying to um, look at the curve of cycles to failure, right? And remember different materials um, have a different relationship between cycles to failure and stress amplitude. And we're trying to reduce the amount of stress such that we can get to the point where we are extending the, the life of that rolling element bearing. You know, that's ultimately where, what we're trying to get to. And the way that we do that is through selecting a viscosity that's able to adequately six, uh, uh, separate those two surfaces. So remember, we have film thickness, but we also have surface roughness. 
right? And the film thickness versus the surface roughness is what we're using to determine how much viscosity we need. Now, the actual film thickness itself, right, um, is typically on this kind of order, right? So to compare roller bearings with, you know, ball bearings, journal bearings, hydrostatic bearings, and gears. So like I said, we're on that kind of one micron range. The actual calculation for lubricant film thickness can be done by uh, this this calculation. So H min is the what we call non-dimensionalized minimum film thickness. You're not going to need to know this for the exam, by the way. I'm, I'm just highlighting um, the different factors that can go into it. G is this uh, factor which uh, comprises of material properties and viscosity. U is the non-dimensionalized entrainment velocity, and W um, uh, gives us the load. This is called the Downson Higginson minimum oil thickness calculation. You don't need to know it. You just need to know that it exists. What's more likely to happen is that you're going to do calculations via some kind of you know chart or app or something like that. This one I think was supplied by FAG, and it shows mean bearing diameter and our capacity to get the rated viscosity. Now all of these colored lines are also going to represent the speed. But what we don't have is the, the mean bearing diameter. So first of all, what is that? So the mean di bearing diameter is where we take um, the outer diameter and we also have the inner diameter and we're trying to take the average of these two, right? Which is why it's uh, one plus the other divided by two. And then we're also going to look at the surface speed in RPM, right? So let's say, for example, I have a bearing where the mean bearing diameter is, well, let's say, 200 millimeters and the speed is 2000 RPM, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take 200, go up to the 2000 line, then read across, and that will give me the rated viscosity of seven center stokes. Now, first of all, you might think, wow, seven center stokes, that's, that's really, really low. Are you, are you sure? And that's because we got to apply an additional calculation, which is called the kappa ratio. Now, the kappa ratio defines the ratio between the actual viscosity and the rated viscosity. So the rated viscosity, remember, is seven center stokes. And then what we have to do is look at what is the actual viscosity in our application. So let's say, for example, we have a viscosity temperature graph uh, for you know a specific range of lubricants. I say, okay, I've got... Um, uh, I think that the bearing is going to operate at about 50 degrees Celsius. And I'm using an ISO 46 lubricant that gives me a 28 centistoke uh, lubricant actual viscosity um, at operating temperature. So we now take that 28 divided by 7, and that gives us a kappa ratio of 4. Now, with the kappa ratio, right, um, a kappa ratio of basically zero, so you know, 0 0.1 and lower, is an indication that you're in boundary lubrication. So you have basically no lubricant film. Once you get between that and about one, that's when you're in the mixed lubrication regime. So that's when your um, actual viscosity versus your rated viscosity is on the same order of magnitude. Beyond that, we're starting to get into full film lubrication. But the reason why you would want a higher kappa ratio is because you are able to extend the life of your bearing. So what happens is with, with bearing life, it starts to increase until you get to about a kappa ratio of four. And beyond that, any additional film thickness doesn't get you any additional bearing life. So that's why a kappa ratio of four is what maximizes your bearing life. And that's one way that you can use to determine the lubricant viscosity. Now in practice, right, the OEM is probably actually going to define what lubricant viscosity should be used. Right? It's very rare, unless you're in the design phase, um, that you would be defining that. But the typical viscosity for rolling element bearings lies somewhere between about 32 and 100 most of the time. Rolling element bearings seem to have, to have that sort of sweet spot there. The second thing you're going to do is determine whether you want to lubricate it with oil or grease. And like we talked about with plain bearings, there are a bunch of different decision points. So with grease, for example, Typically, we can go up to about 120 degrees Celsius if we have specialized greases. Um, DN factors, that's the speed factor, uh, are typically limited to about 350,000. Uh, grease is usually used in rolling element bearings for low to moderate loads. So um, electric motor greases would be a really good example of that. Um, it's not for asymmetrical spherical roller thrust bearings. So that's one limitation you can't use greases for. Um, we can deal with what we call periods of inattention. 
with Greece. What does that mean? Um, it means that uh, often you'll have a, a kind of a rolling element bearing, which we are going to grease, and then maybe it just sits there for a little while, right? Uh, it's either in a non-operating environment or it simply isn't operating for large periods of time. Grease is usually a lot more tolerant of that than oil is, where with oil, you're more likely to develop things like fretting corrosion as well as regular corrosion as well. Um, grease is not really ideal as a common oil for other machine elements. So, you know, bearings are usually part of a of a wider system, right? So maybe you have bearings in a hydraulic system. Well, grease wouldn't be good for that because it doesn't really transmit hydraulic pressure or hydraulic power. So in that instance, you would be restricted to using an oil. Now with oils, we tend to go up to a bulk oil temperature of about 90 degrees Celsius. Obviously, if we use synthetics, we can probably go a little bit higher. DN factors are a little bit higher than grease. We can limit it to about 500,000. We can accommodate a pretty wide range of loads because we can get some very high viscosity oils and it's suitable for all, all types of bearings so we don't have any uh, restrictions there. It doesn't really deal all that well with inner tension. And what we mean by that is that uh, oils that kind of sit on their own tend to take on contaminants from the environment. So not only dust and dirt, but because oils are hygroscopic, they also tend to take on a lot of water as well. And so if you just had an oil system sitting there for large periods of time, it can sometimes result in things like corrosions of the bearing. Um, and the advantage is that if you have bearings which are part of a wider circulating system, then obviously you would use oil. Now, like before, there are also some rules of thumb. So this is where we talk about that, uh, that DN number, sometimes it's called the NDM number, where we take uh, uh, N times that uh, average diameter and we look at it for a range of different types of bearings. And we typically have an upper limit, right, depending on the type of bearing. So um, again, this is a rule of thumb. But if you have any questions, I would consult your OEM. Finally, we also get to the selection of the chemistry. And so again, we use our framework where we start with a base oil. Then we go to an RNO. Then we have anti-wear, EP, as well as detergent style additives. And as we go down the list, we are getting more additized. So remember, with rolling element bearings, they're usually part of some kind of uh, wider plan. So for example, if you had rolling element bearings that were part of a hydraulic system, it's probably going to be an anti-wear oil. If you have rolling element bearings that are part of a gearbox, it's probably going to have some EP. That then drives decisions about compatibility between the materials that are in the rolling element bearing as well as those EP style additives. One other thing I should note about with uh, these, these additives, remember that EP and anti-wear style additives are what we call surface acting. They're attracted to metal surfaces where they bond with them. If you have a, a ceramic style bearing, that's not going to work, right? These things are designed to bond to metals. So again, now ceramic uh, bearings are reasonably rare at the moment and quite expensive. And, and usually they'll have some kind of metal element to them right, because you need uh, that expansion to help fit the bearing on the shaft. But just be cognizant of the fact that um, a lot of the time, those standard anti-wear and EP style additives won't work for a ceramic bearing. And you might need to look at something like a solid lubricant, um, you know, to accommodate uh, that surface chemistry.